welcome to our year-end dinner. Uh, it's our biggest year event of the year at Simmons Aces, so we're really glad you can make it out. Um, and welcome to our speakers as well, Annie, Jennifer, Michael, we're really glad you can make it. And also our former chair is here, Annie Pepitone, and our faculty. for their student travel award. Um, if you haven't heard about it, it's, it's made all the blogs. Um, and we've been sending out lots of emails. And uh, they're really itching for something to read in June and July. So you should apply for that. The deadline is at the end of May. <laughs> and how much is it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Would a NEASIS member like to chime in? <laughs> My goodness, it's a thousand dollars. So uh, I hope you apply if you're eligible. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the first speakers who are doing a joint presentation. Um, yeah, Annie Erdman and Jennifer Ferguson. It's been my pleasure to work with these wonderful librarians for uh, as long as I've been at the Beatley Library. And seeing glimpses of their presentation in staff meetings um, has been really illuminating and really inspiring, so I'm really pleased that they could come and talk to you. Um, they did also do this presentation recently for lunchtime lectures um, at SLIS, but they're adding a little something special, so I'll let them take it away. I I was on Julia's hiring committee, I just like to say that. <laughs> so we're just going to sign in, and again, our presentation is more about another presentation. So we'll give a little bit of a background, um, but our presentation is really about how to do research as a professional and how you partner with vendors, how you can partner with vendors to do that. Um, so our actual presentation, um, we have the link to it. I think it's on SlideShare. It is on SlideShare. It's on SlideShare. So if you search for Jennifer Ferguson, she has the, the link to our actual um, presentation, which is about 45 minutes long. Um, and getting long. And getting longer <laughs> because our story continues to grow. But, um, so we're going to introduce ourselves a little bit. Um, so my name is Annie Erdman. I'm the e-resources and digital assets librarian here at Simmons College, Beatley Library. I, as an undergraduate, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I studied Scandinavian studies and environmental geography. I did my graduate research and studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, because that's where the iSchool is in our state. Um, and I think it's important, Jennifer and I wanted to share a little bit about what we studied in graduate school. Um, so my focus, my research, I had two paths um, because I was a dual master's student. Um, my library training was on information literacy, and then my research was actually on library architecture and design and how the, and how in, the infrastructure and architecture of libraries um, interact with the communities and the peoples that interact with them. I don't do anything related to the things that I study. <laughs> um, so we want to throw out that you know it's important. 
important to remain flexible and adapt. Um, I've been an e-resources librarian for about five years, um, and I really enjoy it. And Jennifer and I have partnered on a couple of things. Um, I'm also the um, program committee chair for VA Assist, um, and I really, really recommend that all the student members in the group, especially, I've heard that quite a few people are graduating, um, we really, really recommend that you become members of MIASIS. We're a really good group. We emphasize networking in the area and learning new skills. Um, so it's a great way to push yourself professionally, even, even if you don't have a professional job yet. For example, um, we're trying to bring in a curriculum to our community that's already been developed, but we kind of want to um, make it modular and chop it up a little bit. And another one of our members has said, oh, I don't get to do this in my real job, but I really want to do curriculum design. Like, I want to volunteer and help do that. Um, so I really want to emphasize that professional organizations are a great way to get marketing experience, communication, public speaking. Um, so it's I really, really recommend that you join. And if you have any questions, you can talk to myself or Roz, she's our chapter president, or Kate, she's our membership person. Um, but yeah, there's a few of us here today, so we're happy to be here. I'm just gonna briefly introduce myself and then we're gonna get into talking about, we're actually gonna do kind of a meta presentation. So it's talking about a presentation you're not going to see. Because yes. that presentation's a little too long. Yeah. But I'm Jennifer Ferguson. I'm a liaison librarian for arts and humanities, arts, humanities, and careers at Simmons. So if, for instance, you have questions about your job hunt, you probably will end up in my office at a certain time. Um, before I came here, I uh, graduated from UCLA, my undergraduate degree, degree in English. I also have a master's degree in English from Rutgers University in New Jersey. And my library's degree is from Simmons, so I'm a Simmons alum too. And my path has not been that direct either. I was a, a corporate senior research associate at a private equity firm for a long time. And I've been a reference, almost a pure reference librarian for a while. And now I'm a liaison librarian, which means I do reference instruction collections. And I've partnered on a lot of research at this institution and my prior institution in academics across the library functions. So I've done conference presentations all over on things as varied as designing library space, doing uh, library instruction, and all of this electronic resources material we're doing right now. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of the mm -hmm. background information about the actual project itself. So our project, we partnered with a company out of Australia called Canopy Streaming Media. And there are a couple of big players in the area of streaming media, especially for librarians um, who are targeting the academic space. And we, I'll talk a little bit more about what makes a good relationship with a vendor, but we had a really good relationship with Canopy. And they actually started doing a study with two Australian academic institutions. And it, they were starting to talk about some really interesting concepts about what's the best business model to do streaming media for? What makes sense for the business? What makes sense for libraries? And we saw this research and we were like, oh, we love Canopy. Is there any way that we can ask the same questions? Is there a way that we can um, engage with what's happening? So I called Tom, who's our sales rep at Canopy. There are only like eight people that work there. So, <laughs> um, and Tom's sister actually owns the company and started it. So I called Tom and I said, hey, Tom, is there any way that we can like get some statistics or like become a part of this? We think it's really cool. How do we, you know, start the conversation? Um, and Tom said, well, actually, you're one of our first U.S. clients and you know, UMass Amherst is also really interested in um, these types of questions in the U.S. Maybe we could partner up with UMass Amherst and kind of redo the research study and expand it a little bit more. Um, so we're actually, what we were specifically looking at 
um, was if patron-driven acquisitions was the most effective form of business model for streaming media specifically. And this isn't talking about books. You, the scope is really tight. You know, it's streaming media films, and we're looking at patron-driven acquisitions, which means that the collection is opened up. So you've got a whole bunch of streaming media films, and the collection is opened up to your end users. And as your end users watch the films that are relevant to them, they trigger a purchase after so many views. And for Canopy, it's a very generous trigger. I think it's five. It's five. So mm -hmm. somebody has to watch the film five times in order to trigger a purchase. So we wanted to see if this model was good or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, our research took a couple of different kind of angles. The first part was uh, exploring patron-driven acquisition for streaming films. The second part of it was something that the study that we originally saw did not address. They were talking about how many people on their campuses use streaming media in their personal lives but had no idea the library can provide that for their classroom work. And so we wanted to, to also test how we could outreach to faculty to see if we could increase use of our streaming collections. And we'd done a little faculty outreach around other platforms in the past, but this time we had a very focused and very tight research schedule on how we're going to do faculty outreach using Google Analytics to track links to find out who's coming to, to what film from which. And the third part, as we say we're adding more of our research, is we're doing research right now on user behavior. So we're getting referring URL data f to find out where our users are coming from. So are they coming out of the course management system? Are they coming off the platform? Are they coming through the library catalog? These are things we're exploring. How long are they staying on the platform? How often are they coming back? These are the kinds of uh, research questions we're working. Oh, I hate that. Uh, we're working on right now. Okay. So why do all this and what's the point? There is a, there's a lot of um, ins and outs to doing this kind of research, but it really pays off. And one of the biggest reasons why to do this, A, we're really finding out what our patrons use and how they're using it. That helps us to serve them better. We're also finding out what our faculty are interested in using. So instead of trying to make them aware of things we bought and hope they use, we're actually pushing out to things, the things we know they're using because we're doing the research to find out. And the other thing is with declining library budgets, and this is across institutions everywhere, our budget situation is such that if you don't do this kind of data-driven analysis of your collections, you're not going to be getting the most bang for your buck when you're looking at it. Yeah, you're not going to be able to answer mm -hmm. the questions, which is what's actually being used. Right. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the data. So when you are in a professional position, and you're thinking about doing research, you have to think about what you have to work with, right? So what data is available to you? So the um, data that is generally available to us and to all of you once you go out in the field and those of you who are in the field right now, you can get counter reports, um, you can get non-counter reports, and actually there are a lot of non-counter reports out there. It's shocking at how many non-standard reports there are. So at Simmons Library, we're actually gathering all of the usage statistics for all of our databases right now. And as my two library assistants will can attest to, that it's bananas. You know, it's views, mm -hmm. it's clicks, it's playbacks, it's what do we make of this? How do we make apples to apples cost per use comparisons? Um, you know, is a, is a use, a session, or a search? We had a really good discussion about that. Um, <laughs> you can get ILS data, so integrated library system. You can get a lot of information, and actually, we were really lucky that our metadata librarian, Andrew, was so, hi, Andrew, was <laughs> so good at manipulating mm -hmm. our data, and that our metadata was good enough to use. Mm -hmm. UMass didn't have an, g enough good internal metadata. They couldn't answer as many questions as we could because Andrew was talking directly to Canopy and working with them to see exactly what they were looking for. You can get interlibrary loan data. 
And Google Analytics, again, we use this. It's really simple to set up and use, and we used it for our research mm -hmm. to track links. So you can tell, well, this is in the actual report, but you can tell, you know, where people are going, how long they're staying, how long mm -hmm. they're staying on a page, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's all blind, right? So there's no personal information mm -hmm. attached to the Google Analytics. It's really just about the behavior, which is what we're interested in. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what return on investment means in libraries. So the big thing that we're measuring in our study is return on investment. And in our case, we're measuring what we consider cost per use in a library. So across various platforms, you have different ways of measuring cost per use. And Annie just mentioned it is a cost per click, cost per playback, cost per search. So we're trying to narrow it down specifically for streaming media collections. And we're measuring it across our Canopy platform as well as our other streaming platforms that we actually have some, some uh, owned collections of streaming media. So what we found is that Canopy, a cost per use, is actually per 30 second play on their platform. So somebody has to go on there and play a film for at least 30 seconds for that to register as a use. We have another platform called Filmmakers Library Online, which is uh, from a provider called Alexander Street Press. They calculate it as cost per click. So if someone just clicks the play button, it doesn't matter how long they stay on the page or how long they watch the film. If they just click the play, play button, that's calculated as a use. So that's how they calculate it. We also did a major comparison of our uh, DVD physical media collection, our DVD collection, and we're calculating cost per checkout here. So in other words, how many times a DVD has been checked out, we're sort of equating that to how many times a film has been watched on one of these platforms. Now, a lot of people like to bring up, can you do that on a DVD? Because you don't know if it's being checked out for an entire classroom to watch or an individual to watch. And you don't know how long someone's checking it out to watch for. But that's the same thing is true on a streaming platform. So we don't know, for instance, if someone watched a film on Canopy, if it was a, a faculty member showing that film in class, that still counts as only one view. So we can look at it as a very equivalent measure that way. And what we have really found, the Canopy patron-driven acquisition model, the cost per use is a fraction of what cost per use even on a DVD is. Based on the average cost of DVDs, all the other costs that go along with managing physical collections, processing them, checking them out, human time involved, loss costs, damage costs. Canopy, on the Canopy platform, we found it's, it's actually the most cost-effective way of making thousands of videos available to our patrons. Okay. So that was really exciting. We got yeah. to answer, we basically confirmed the findings of the Australian institutions in the U.S. at a small liberal arts school and at UMass Boston, which is a much larger institution. So the thing that's really interesting for us uh, so often is cross-functional collaboration. So how did we get a project like this done? Because I'm not you know, an e-resources e or tech librarian. I'm on the user end. But what we found, and this is something that I've really found is the case in all of my positions in, in academic libraries, is the better you know the whole library from the back to the front, and I look at it as back to front rather than front to back, because if you think about how collections make their way into the library and then ma somebody makes its way into the end user's hands, it's kind of a process of that way. And the more you know about how the whole institution like that functions, the better off you can collaborate and you can make much better working teams because you're speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in extremely important to speak the same language when you're in a library. And if you can, shadow somebody for a day, right? Shadow an e-resources mm -hmm. librarian, shadow a cataloging librarian, an acquisitions librarian. Mm -hmm. It's just a day, just get an insight. And don't ignore user services librarians. <laughs> Because we are actually on the front lines. We're seeing how the patrons are interacting with what we're providing to them. And we're trying to help and instruct them. And the more we know about those systems ourselves, the better we can teach those systems to our users. Mm -hmm. Want to talk about the Canopy project and specifically? Sure. Um, so <laughs> the Canopy project, we, I partnered um, with Jennifer. And 
we outsourced a little bit of the project to Andrew, like I mentioned before. But I was I did a lot of the data gathering in terms of how much everything cost, what the licensing terms were, the data, etc. Um, and Jennifer was really great because she works as our de facto media librarian. Mm-hmm. So she was really great in bringing the perspective of helping the liaisons to get on board and actually participate in the study and engage with their faculty. That was a crucial part of the study, and Jennifer brought that to the equation. So I think that that was key um, for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely key for us. And and a big part of it is um, when you're trying to measure essentially two different things. So you're measuring cost per use, and you're gathering data and statistics, but on the other hand, you're trying to figure out, well, if we have all this great stuff, how do we get people to use it? Mm -hmm. And how do we know that they're using it? So partnering from both ends of the library gives you a much broader perspective on on how collections work together. So forming external partnerships. I work with a lot of vendors (coughs) every year, hundreds. Um, And part of that is just establishing a really, really great relationship. And you can do that in a number of ways. I highly recommend implementing an electronic resource management system in order to do that. We use Coral here at Simmons, and a lot of the Fenway Libraries online libraries also use Coral. It just allows you to keep the information organized so that you don't feel like you're juggling all these vendor balls in the air by yourself. The system really helps you with that. Um, When you're thinking about doing a research project with a vendor, it's really important that you really like the vendor and the product, that you've already got something good to begin with, Um, because then it it helps you stay excited throughout the process, and it actually helps you work better. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to talk to a sales rep that you have a great reputation with than someone you talk to once a year or they seem to, the mm-hmm. company seems to be changing your sales rep all the time. And then once you've got a vendor and a product that you really want to support or work with, you think of interesting questions, right? So does this business model work for us? It's a, it's a new business model for us. Simmons doesn't, we're not doing anything in patron-driven acquisitions Yet, although we will start JSTOR eBooks, I believe, coming up this fall. Um, so we really wanted to ask questions that we cared about. That was interesting to us. Um, and then we worked, you know, we worked as a team. You know, Canopy came and said, this is what we can help you with. And we said, this is what we can bring to the table. Um, now, we had a third partner um, at mm-hmm. UMass Boston. So it was UMass really, Amherst. You, I'm sorry, UMass Amherst. Um, Scott would be like, what? Um, (laughs) Scott's our our, our Mm -hmm. companion at UMass Amherst. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's really important to also be really direct in this process Um, and with your vendor at all times. You know, what can you do? What can you not do? What what do you have in your data? What can you not do? For us, um, our licensing terms prevents us from talking about how much we Mm -hmm. pay for things. Um, at Alexander Street Press. I said right up front that we could not provide that data. Luckily, Scott is at a state institution, so he was like, here you go, I've got all this data. Um, So that's great. The other thing that was really important for Simmons, again, not so much for Scott at UMass because they have a bigger budget, but I was really upfront about when we were going to be presenting at conferences and the fact that Jennifer and I had very limited traveling funds. So we were very very direct up front about, hey, if you want us to do this and you want us to present this, you have to sponsor me for one conference and you have to sponsor Jennifer for at least one conference. I think they're sponsoring two. They paid two. They paid for me for two. Um, But that was because Mm -hmm. I said up front and I negotiated that all right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing that I'll say is your sales rep is really busy. Their primary task is not getting the data together. It's sales. So I've had Mm -hmm. to be pretty consistent with our sales rep and Canopy about what data I needed, why, and when I needed it by. Um, And that's certainly true for the latest data that we're getting about Mm -hmm. the um, referring URLs. You know, where are people coming from 
um, when they go to the Canopy platform, and I'll just give you a little preview, it's from Moodle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Um, it, it is, and, and it confirms our hypothesis that most of these films are being used in classes and are being used in place of course reserves, right. physical course reserves, which is another really mm -hmm. interesting tidbit to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the story keeps developing, and when we mm -hmm. get to ALA, we will definitely have to pare down because it's just the story is too big at this point. It is. The story is getting really large. Okay, so telling the story, that's a good, a good lead-in. So we've been speaking at a lot of conferences. So Charleston, ERNL, we're speaking at ALA in June. We've done some local conference work, like the ERMEG Electronic, Re uh, what is it, Electronic Resources Management Interest Group? Yes. It's interesting to me because this is not usually my area of specialization. I'm usually out at the instruction conferences. Or yeah. the, so this has been a really interesting set of conferences for me to speak at and attend. Um, and I proposed um, originally that uh -huh. we go to, that we present at Netzel, but it just didn't fit. But it's just another example of another really great regional conference that you can present information with. And I've mm -hmm. seen um, other presentations at Netzel where um, libraries partner with vendors mm -hmm. to present data. I think Northeastern partnered with Springer, um, not mm -hmm. this year, but last year. And an interesting thing that comes out of this, and, and Annie started off by encouraging everyone to join NEASIS, and I would encourage also everyone to be really active professionally like this, because the Charleston conference, when I was presenting this, our first round of data there last November, I had a conversation with somebody from EBSCO. That's now led to our second big research project, where we're partnering with EBSCO to do major usability testing on our discovery layer implementation. So we're partnering with them to gather all kinds of data again, and we have this good relationship. And like you said, up front, I had this conversation right away when they asked if I would be interested in presenting out things we find. I said, are you going to pay for it? Because our travel funds are limited. So if you're willing to sponsor and pay, we'll do these things. And don't hesitate to ask, ask for money. And the, one of the great, um, I think, outcomes of this particular piece of research is We've had people come up to us, including the vet, all the vendors in this field, telling us we are driving the conversation now about how media is acquired, how you value media, and what true value is when you're measuring your return on investment for various kinds of purchase models with media. Again, you can't generalize to books because that's a very different thing right now, but specifically for video and media, um, they, they, we are now driving the conversation. And I think it is getting buzzed. When I was mm -hmm. in Minneapolis for LibTech last month, um, they, I wasn't presenting mm -hmm. on Canopy. I was presenting and running a workshop on how to use Coral. Um, but I introduced myself and I said, I'm from Simmons College, and we're actually, you might have seen us around, we're talking a lot about PDA and streaming media with Canopy. And then half the room was like, oh, yeah, okay. We've mm -hmm. heard of this, mm -hmm. um, and I had a few people in that conference come up and ask me questions. So uh, it, mm -hmm. it's getting out there. Um, the one thing that I want to say about working with vendors is that it's also really important that librarians and libraries push back. Mm -hmm. that we ask interesting questions about business models, and we're very upfront, and we can prove that the business models don't work for us. So the other area where this is really coming out, and this was very evident at ERNL, was short-term loans for eBooks. It's not working for libraries, and it's not working for publishers either, unless you're the state of California. Um, you know, it, it's just yeah. not. It's not working. The business model isn't good on either end. It's really expensive for libraries, and publishers are losing money. So mm -hmm. it's a great example of librarians and publishers coming together and saying, you know, the data shows us that it's not working. How can mm -hmm. we change this? What are other options? Yeah. But you really have to be upfront. You've got to challenge those vendors. And never, ever take the first offer that a vendor comes to you and says, this is your price. Mm -hmm. No. Don't do it. <laughs> no. Don't be afraid to negotiate. Unless it's a really good price. Yeah, <laughs> unless you know you're getting a bargain. Unless you know you're getting a really good deal. So we started out with why. Why do all this? Well, this is why. Because it benefits libraries and it benefits patrons. Yeah. We give them more material that they want. We give them in a format they can access and that they prefer. 
and we actually are paying less for it, and we're getting a lot more uh, return on our investment for all of these kind of media collections. Mm -hmm. So that's why you do a big project like this in the end, is to better serve your user population. Mm -hmm. So, lessons learned. <laughs> okay, so um, for those of you who are at Ermig, you might mm -hmm. have, and I guess some of this come up, came up at Charleston, you mm -hmm. find out really quickly as you're presenting um, people's touchy spots. Or, yeah. you know, that kind of sounded funny. But, you know, <laughs> sensitive, like, places, yes. and then you're like, oh, I just stepped on that landmine. Um, and for us, it really came to the idea of permanence. So I'm talking mm -hmm. to the e-resources librarian at Boston College right now about PDA and streaming because their collection development people really don't see the value in buying something that you don't have in perpetuity, you know, like a chair or a book. If they want to buy something, they want to keep it forever. Well, our research is showing that you don't actually want to keep it forever because mm -hmm. the relevancy tanks after three years. Um, so it, it's been interesting that I did I did not expect that landmine to happen, and um, I totally stepped in it at Ermig. I didn't <laughs> even understand what the woman from Brown was saying. <laughs> you didn't, uh, yeah. <laughs> I had to ask for a clarification. <laughs> <laughs> because there is still resistance to this idea that we are not necessarily purch purchasing these items and we have them forever in our collection now. The way the Canopy PDA works, you, they have a, a suite of films. Right now it's about 20,000 films that they open up to your population. Those films are there and available. You don't necessarily have them licensed unless somebody watches them for at least five times, five views. Our research on our DVD shows uh, checkouts drop drastically the longer you own a DVD, and a very small percentage of DVDs get checked out more than five times, even DVDs that have been on reserve very rarely. What we're finding is our usage numbers for Canopy per view is so much higher than our checkouts on DVDs ever were because it's a convenient format. It's so much easier for students to view reserves in their dorm room than have to come in and hope the, the DVDs on the shelf and they can and watch it in the library. And, and not scratched and yeah. it's returned on time. So it's a very big question. But we're, that's why we're not trying to overgeneralize from this data to other kinds of collections, but for media particularly, this is a, a, a model that really works. Yep. And it is a, still a very touchy subject. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> As we know. Uh, we, other, we also learned a lot about developing effective faculty outreach, how to get people to actually be aware of what you're doing. We did use Google Analytics, and we tried pushing all this kind of information out on multiple platforms. And interestingly, we did find that liaison or emails direct to their faculty were the most effective way of promoting resources, but only if they were targeted by subject and by content, specifically to faculty who'd be interested in that content. Yep. So we found that out, which is really interesting. And the other thing about being honest with your faculty, tell them how much things cost. That, as a liaison, that's always been my philosophy. So if a faculty member requests something, that is a highly specialized resource, I'm, I'm willing to have that conversation, do you know how much this costs? Because they usually don't. And you could talk about managing the time, because this yeah. scope creep has been huge. Yes, so um, <laughs> uh, originally, I thought this project would be, we'll just provide a little bit of data, mm -hmm. and then UMass Amherst will take on the show. They'll go on the road, they'll do all the heavy lifting. That is not what turned out to happen at all. Mm -mm. Um, <laughs> so um, Jennifer and I have put in a lot of time and effort into this, and I know that Andrew is actually in charge of our um, EBSCO Discovery Service evaluation, and he is also seeing this project creep yeah, scope occurring. Creep. Scope creep. So it's really important to think about mm -hmm. your priorities as a library and talk with your administration about what you can push to the side, what you can move forward more quickly, what you need in terms of resources um, to get things done. Now, again, we're a really small staff, so Jennifer mm -hmm. and I really just made it work. Um, so mm -hmm. I, it's something that I would think, uh, you know, knowing now what I know, <laughs> I, I've learned, I would, mm -hmm. I would be... If you sign up for something like this, it's going to take more time than you think it yeah. will. 
always. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, any questions? Mm-hmm. Yes. So, um, would you say to avoid maybe so much so sleep? Do you think what you thought was a simple thing at first you would make it even more? So, I actually, when I think of when I think about this mm-hmm. in retrospect, I, I think we probably should have had a specific research question in mind, and then our outcome, sh- our desired outcome probably should have been a paper, right, for a journal publication. Because that really keeps you focused. You know, you're answering one question, you're writing one paper. And at that point, if we wanted to ask more questions, we could have, you know, <laughs> written another paper, but again, all of that time and all of that research communicates to your administration that this is worth it, and this is a research project that's leading to, you know, a specific point. Um, Because at this point, Jennifer and I basically Mm -hmm. have done three separate research projects with Canopy, because we've Mm -hmm. asked three separate specific research questions, and that's kind of why it's gotten a little bit out of control. Um, uh, the other thing is our own curiosity. Yeah, we're so excited. A- as we're finding out more and more, we want we want to know even more, and yeah. we have more questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We have more questions we want to continue to yeah. answer. So we're we're kind of responsible for the scope creep in a lot of ways because every time we think we've answered one question, it leads us to another set of questions. Yeah that we find interesting and want to answer as well. Mm-hmm. So at the lunchtime lecture, you mentioned that some of the vendors were sort of outright aggressive. Yes. yes. So <laughs> what that looks like and, and what their fear is and, and how to sort of handle that. Hostile vendors. Hostile vendors. Hostile vendors. Um, um, yes. Yes. We, we have been challenged by hostile vendors. By hostile vendors. vendors. And that's and why we that's say, why we, um, say um, we are driving, we are driving the, conversation. the conversation. The vendors are telling us this. And they, and don't, they want don't want to have to change their, change their business, business models, models to reflect, to reflect what, our what our data is telling us. Is telling us. But, the but the data is so compelling that it's making other librarians out there ask them those questions. Recently we had hosted here in Simmons on the Waldo streaming media day. Media day. Streaming media streaming media vendors, vendors from all over came in, uh, and, uh, they and they got, got a lot of questions about Canopy and, and about EA. And, and, EA. and, and they, were they were really, really getting angry that oh, everybody, everybody was going to ask, ask, this, ask this question. So, I mean, strategically, I did not go. I did not go. I had a conflict that morning. Because I wanted to... I wanted to I step wanted away to step because away I also read the human resources hat and I do all the um, negotiations here at Center. Yes. Yes. So I wanted so to I wanted maintain to a little bit outside, outside of the whole. Of the whole. It's one thing it's to be at a conference, conference in, Texas in Texas and be talking about these things, but it's another it's thing to be in your own house, house and challenging vendors that you're going to have to negotiate with. You know, so I think that there's some sensitivity. I I would say, in general, like, I I have had some pretty tough negotiations. And I think it depends on who the sales rep is, right? Um, So, I mean, I have have told the sales rep and his boss at Elsevier, I don't give a fine, you know, whatever this license term is, I want it in writing. I don't care what you say. Um, I've been working on this for two months, and if you don't have this to me by Friday, you go fly kite. Um, I only swore once. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I did have some contracts. I mean, you're that's remarkably, that's remarkably restrained. restrained. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I did have the contract by Friday. Um, but I think that it's also, you know, if, um, so for example, the Alexander Street Press rep, she's gotten upset um, in person in a conference room in the library. And I just asked her if she wanted some water or if she needed to go to the restroom. And I think that, you know, just asking a sales rep, who's kind of giving out of, you know, like, you know, like, calm down. Like, this is just library stuff. Um, you know, it's like, this is not a hospital. This is not the ER. This is libraries. Um, you know, it's like.
like, like you're being a little, you need to take a time out. Like, let me go get you some water. Or do you need to take a walk? Well, well, you, 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 when, you, you, when you're thinking about dealing with vendors, vendors you, have you have to understand that the history of history librarian, librarian dealing with vendors is usually, usually okay, 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 thanks, by the librarian. By the librarian. Yeah. And, the and the pushback is, is, something, is new. something new. And if you're, and pushing, if you're pushing back, back because, because you have data behind you, that's really, really new. And it's scary. It's scary. Plus, they won't be able to afford their, like, in-grounds school because they're not going to get their bonus numbers or whatever. You know, I mean, like, I'm going to remember. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's how I do. <laughs> Julia, how about sensitivities from librarians? As as students, we talk a lot about things becoming electronic from the library and the book collections that we love and came to librarianship for in many uh, cases. Do you, do you feel like? there's a misconception from librarians that their jobs are going to go away if they embrace patron-driven acquisitions? There is. There is. Yeah. Yeah. There is. That's, there a, is. Really That's a really good question. question. That's a really, That's good, a really good, question. good question. And there, and been, there, have been, there, there was a whole debate, debate, debate panel, panel, panel at Charleston on that very, on that very topic. topic. And, and there was a there lot of arguing pro and con. Now, my now, answer, my answer to that question is, and I understand the sensitivity, but as a person, as a person responsible, responsible for collections, as a collections as a librarian, who's responsible, responsible for collecting in the arts and humanities, my answer, my answer is, I'm not, I'm not letting the patrons select, from, select where from where they're selected. I'm saying, I'm saying this is a, this a set, set of resources that I think is high quality. Now, you tell me out this set, which ones you actually want to use. So I'm, so still, I'm still selecting the things, the things I am available, available to them, but I'm not, but I'm paying, not paying for anything, they're, anything they're, not they're not using. And that's a difference. And that's a difference. It's, 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 so you have so to, like everything, like everything else, instructions flipping with new frameworks. Everything's, everything's around, flipping around, and this is also, this is also flipping around the librarian's kind of, kind of uh, responsibility. And I think as the economic climate changes, I mean, I definitely know at Beatley Library at Simmons, we, we feel to, we feel, feel this, this to the nth degree that, that every cent we spend is student tuition, tuition dollars, dollars, right? That collection that budget, budget is actually, actually all of your tuition money. So it's our, it's, our, it's my, job, my job, it's Jennifer's Jennifer job, job to spend that collection that money, money to, the, to, the, <coughs> to get the best, best return on investment we can and to make the collection, collection the best, best we can with yeah, the money the that you're providing with us. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we, I feel, feel, that. we feel that. I know I, I know I do. Yes. I don't, yes. I don't think, think that also helps. helps. <laughs> I just do the negotiation. I just yeah. do the buying and negotiating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean yeah. again, I mean, it's a joint yeah. effort, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The liaison mm -hmm. team, team does all of the selecting, selecting, and that allows me to not have, I don't care what resource we get. I don't care if something gets cut. I don't care if it's great. Okay, I do need old rigs, but, you know. But the use of the I just got a usage today, and it's like, 20, 20, 20, 000, 000, 000, 000. It's like, oh, this world's crazy. That will never that be that. Will never be <laughs> uh, uh, again, again, and that's because we're, 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 we're data driven. So, so we're not going to cut things that get high use. But we need to, we need to know what's getting used, used so that we, so that can, we can pay for what's being used, used and, and not pay not for things, things that we think you guys might like, but don't actually like or want to use. Yeah, guessing. Guessing doesn't work Nobody does it well. Faculty do it poorly. Librarians do it poorly. You know, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? One last question. Yeah. When did you start this? Oh, gosh. Last summer. Last summer. A year ago in July, I think. Yeah. Year ago in July. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Charleston is in November. Yeah. Charleston's November, and that's when we had our first set of data. We'll have, our, we had our second in Texas, and we have our third set we'll be giving in, in June Francisco. in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have the uh, <laughs> privilege of uh, introducing our next presenter. And um, Michael Leach is the head of collection development at Tabit Science Library at Harvard University. Uh, he's worked in science libraries for more than 25 years in a variety of positions, including reference, technical services, and management. In addition, he is an adjunct faculty member here at SLIPS, uh, where he's taught courses on information technology, 
web publishing, collection development, and database management for more than a decade. He is a PhD candidate at Simmons uh, here, currently working on his dissertation, which focuses on the information behaviors of very creative individuals. And over the past 18 years, Michael has taught over 45 continuing education programs, reaching nearly 600 colleagues, and he's been a frequent speaker at conferences, including annual meetings of ALA, ACIS, ACRL, and SLA. He is a past president for ACIS, and I just want to interject that being really tech savvy and being a good coder and being really knowledgeable of web development and emerging technologies is a skill in and of itself, but being able to articulate and explain those same things is a completely separate skill. And I was both of these, so we're very grateful to have him. I'm actually one of these roaming presenters. Most of you know this if you've seen me speak before. And it's because my energy level is so high that it's standing still like this is really hard. <laughs> but I'll work on it. I'm actually going to be talking about two things, both briefly, but to give you an overview of uh, different areas. And this came out of discussions I had with the folks planning this program. So double play, I'm going to be talking about uh, electronic versus print in reference. And I'm going to talk about information science technology careers. Um, many of you have an MLIS, and many of you focus on the L component, which is great. I'm a librarian as well. But there is the information science component to your degree, and there are plenty of jobs and opportunities in those fields. Um, so this idea of electronic versus print, I have some questions for you. This is interactive. Okay. <laughs> How many of you still like print reference in all its forms? Anyone? A couple, that's fine. How many of you prefer electronic reference materials? Yeah. That's pretty much what you see across the board. And this is with a group of librarians and library students, right? So you'd expect it to be a little bit more sort of conservative, moving toward the print. Um, let me ask you another question. What do we mean by reference materials? What is reference resources these days? What are reference resources? Dictionaries, the sources, atlases, mm -hmm. Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Dictionaries, the Sarai, good. Atlases. Encyclopedias, like Wikipedia, indexes, good. And when you're thinking of these words, what things are popping into your head? Well, encyclopedias, you think of Wikipedia now, not the Encyclopedia Britannica that I grew up with. <laughs> Um, how many of you have heard of the Encyclopedia Britannica? <laughs> when was the last time someone used it? Last week. Last week. Good. Okay. 1990 for my kids. For your kids. Children. Good. How, when's the last time you personally used it? Last summer. Last summer? We can go for a reference assignment. A reference assignment. I always have a reference assignment. So when you think of dictionary, what do you think of now? I think of Google. I actually keep a print one right on my desk, and I find myself more often than not just typing the word into Google and just seeing if I spelled it right. <laughs> I'm terrible at spelling. It's not my area of expertise. And then, then there's the more in-depth reference. What do I mean by that? I mean, most of you know, you shake your heads up and down. What do we mean by the in-depth reference? JSTOR. JSTOR, OK. What else? Technical literature. Technical literature. Good. Anything else? Yeah. Journals are these for research papers and journals. Yeah, the actual, almost the primary literature in many ways. But if I think of reference these days, that's in depth, it's a summary of that material. So you've got this layer of the original material, which can be in things like JSTOR, it could be things like from Elsie Bear. It could be materials out of video, canopy, etc. But frequently, that material is summarized and put in context 
and that will give you the more in-depth reference materials. And that's the part that we're going to talk about in more detail in a moment. Um, so print is dead in reference series. And that was pretty much determined about a decade ago. Okay? That, there was a wonderful little story, you know, rest in peace, Lord. I didn't create that one. <laughs> Go in and search, you'll see, you know, book dead, this thing pops up everywhere. It's an actual tombstone, by the way. Someone created it. <laughs> um, this was a huge debate ten years ago with reference materials. Should we have print? Should we have E? By 2008, pretty much everyone had decided it was going to be E. So we've had a good seven plus years since then. And to give an example, you know, book list from the 1st of January, you know, 08, page 127, if you want to see a good summary of what was going on at that particular time. But there are niche groups. Historians particularly enjoy having the original print. But then the question came up, well, what is original now? Everything is born what? Or digital. When was the last time someone was actually created like on a typewriter? <laughs> How many of you actually have a typewriter still? One, two. Okay, I'm just curious. Do they work? Yes. <laughs> there are USB typewriters. Each other. You hook them into your computer. And so others, and of course, yeah, others that are interested in this might be archivists, looking at issues of provenance and things like that, tracing the aspects of various things, but in your library, in your given library, and let's talk the gamut, school libraries, public libraries, small colleges, large colleges, research centers, etc. It's hands on down E. But E is in trouble. And I loved your presentation on statistics, because I've been doing statistical analysis of resources for over a decade now, as part of my collections work. And I've been looking at even indexes and abstracting databases, in addition to reference materials. Everything in those areas is going down. The only exception that I see are the primary literature resources. Our e-journal packages, for instance, our um, video packages, like in the sciences, Joe, the Journal of Visualized Experiment work is like shooting through the roof and they're adding more and more of this type of material. I'm really surprised that some of the, the um, indexes and abstracts that I thought were really strong aren't as strong as I saw it say when I did a search eight years ago versus one that I did this year. And why? Because there's competition. And some of the competition sources are up there. There are many reports now that show that Wikipedia is as good if not better than, what was that one I mentioned earlier? Wikipedia <laughs> 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 Britannica, which was considered the gold stone, you know, the king of kings type thing when it came to that type of ready reference. Google Scholar, fantastic resource for reference materials and some of the in-depth review components. So people will write review articles, and they might get published in journals, or they might be published in conference papers, or they might be published on a web page, and Google Scholar captures all of that. Um, other things like PubMed, there's a lot of review material now in the medical sciences that normally would have been considered in-depth reference materials, but is now showing up almost as if it was an article. So we have the disambiguation component, breaking up what used to be like thinking about a large in-depth research encyclopedia or something along those lines and then taking it apart and putting it together in an e-resource. And there are other free databases along these lines. Those are going up. As an example, I ended up canceling the Chemical Dictionary at Harvard just literally two weeks ago. Our analysis showed that it reached the point now where on a per search basis it was nine dollars per search we were paying for. That's a lot of money just for our search. <laughs> It reminds me of the days when I used to have to go in online and have to time my searches and, you know, so that went. And we checked with faculty and we checked with the students and the thing is they're getting that type of information online in these free resources, like things like PubMed, etc. in the process. But is there are some hidden aspects that maybe do something a little different, we'll increase it. Yeah, there's a reason for these images that you're seeing. <laughs> you'll, you'll learn about that soon. Okay. Um, everyone here, I would bet, has some information overload issues. Is there anyone here who's plenty of time to browse? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Even I'm more of the days like, oh, this 
group this to talk, this blah, blah, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> or you just create folders, and you know, my, I don't want to look at that folder, that gets deleted. You know, emails or anything else you turn up to, it's too much. And that's what a lot of our patrons feel. Which is why I love when you said, a smaller selection, you get to choose from this plate. They, they like that. As long as the plate is good choice, that's the key there, is to find out you made the right choice in getting that together. Um, and so, we have a lot of statistics now that are showing that if you combine your reference materials and other resources into instruction and into reference and into other ways, um, usage goes up. As an example, I work for, uh, I, even though my job is collections librarian, I do some reference and instruction. And I liaison to the psych department, psychology department. And every year I probably meet every single psychology student through a series of training workshops. And we created a special guide for them and we selected certain resources. And the first year we used those resources and then we saw uptick. And the second year it was even a larger uptick and we could even time the upticks to shortly after having the classes. But once the environment of psychology after a few years got used to this, it's a steady growth. People are talking to each other in the departments. So a senior might be talking to a junior, or a grad student might be talking to an undergrad, et cetera, et cetera. That's one of the ways you can sort of promote growth. Again, as long as the resource is useful in their minds. So that's part one. Careers. <laughs> ISG. <clears throat> Your non-library possibilities. Yes. Super squirrel. <laughs> there is a, let me just tell you, if you've ever been in Harvard Yard, which is full of tourists every time of the year, even with the snowstorms we had, and they're all bending down taking pictures of what? Squirrels. Squirrels. <laughs> it's Everywhere. Squirrel fishing. It's a squirrel. I'm going to pick some of these that I know fairly well in a variety of different aspects. One is knowledge management. Knowledge management has been around since the 90s as a strong sort of profession to work in. Um, it's focused primarily on the corporate health sector in similar areas. IT, tech, things like that still fo focus on knowledge management. The idea is, is to collect that intellectual capital. People work in an organization and if they leave people say, oh man, all that stuff is in their head. That's what knowledge management is trying to do, is collect the things that are in people's heads on a regular, integrated, day-to-day -day basis. So if they're working in an R&D component or if they're working in management or other levels of the company, there are systems in place, and you can buy these, some of them are turnkey, some of them are developed specifically depending on the company you're working for, grabs all this information. And you as the knowledge management manager get to make sense out of this. And one of the key aspects of knowledge management is so you don't reinvent the wheel. Someone goes, you've got that knowledge when they leave. You build upon that. If someone said, this was so, so difficult in R&D to get to this point, Ah, well, we never have to do that again, because we learned what you do to get to that point. Someone new comes in, or a new team is working on a project, ah, we've got that part down, we'll save ourselves a lot of time, effort, and money. Um, our program here did have a strong knowledge management component at one point, just like any other school or organism. We move in one direction, we come back to another direction, etc. There are other programs you can focus on if you want to get more advanced degrees or certificates in this. And with each of these slides, I'm focusing on one, but know that there are many resources you can connect to if you want to learn more. So for instance, SLA, and I was a member of SLA for many years, I learned most of my knowledge management skills was through SLA and the Knowledge Management Division. Um, I was very active with them in the 90s and early 2000s in that process. And you're going to save these and put them somewhere, am I correct? Yes, so you'll be able to look at that link. Competitive intelligence. Um, I actually got this. I'll just as a little story. I had no clue what competitive intelligence was. Competitive intelligence was until actually I became a, a really strong member of ASIS in the 90s, and I actually met competitive intelligence professionals. This was before <coughs> Skip was used. Um, I thought this is fascinating. I put the like Sherlock Holmes part there because a lot of your job is to find out what the other company is doing. You have to do it legally. <laughs> that was a bit of a bummer to learn that. <laughs> but you gather all this knowledge you can, and then you put it into reports and you give it to middle or senior managers. 
And then hopefully if you did it right and you packaged it correctly, they'll use that and make a good business decision and your company will improve. That's the, the essence of competitive intelligence. And again, we've had on and off in this program here, courses in, in this area. Mm -hmm. And we've yeah. had professionals that have brought in. So um, keep that in mind. It's Every fun. spring, it's a great course. Yeah, so you took it. Yes, yes. I loved it. Who taught it recently? Cynthia Correa. Oh, Cynthia, yes. I love Cynthia. She's wonderful. Yes. She was one of the ones that I connected to early on in this, in this area. She's in Vermont now, isn't she? Yeah. Information retrieval. So IR is a long standing, both computer science and information science. It's sort of like it's been a huge success story, IR, and both areas claim it as theirs in many different ways. Um, this is, well, most of you know what a database is. That's structured information. Most of you know what XML is. That's structured information. Unstructured information is the primary component between information retrieval as a suite of technologies and research and theory and things like that. Um, probably the two biggest words attached to it are precision recall. And it's if you were in org with me, you better say yes. <laughs> <laughs> These are great formulas, and I was tempted to put those formulas up there, but man, <laughs> we'll save ourselves. Um, this goes back to you know, Bob Bush's famous paper in 1945, but really didn't kick off until the 50s, and then really built up in the 60s as an area of research. It continues today, although it, I would say it's a it's mature point, and it's just a refinement component. However, this refinement is still really important. It drives the search engine technology of today. So the Googles and other search engines that are out there and competing are still using the principles of information retrieval. Probably one of the biggest resources is the ACM's CIR. And it's through the ACM CIR that uh, Gerald Salton, who's one of the sort of founders of this sort of profession, um, they created the Salton Award. So you all know what the Nobel Prize was, if any the highest award you can get in information retrieval is the Salton. Most of you are familiar with this. We have strong courses in this. We teach it in a variety of different ways. Um, of course, we have a lab, etc. here. This is a huge growth area. IA, Information Architecture, has had some ups and downs. Um, it was booming along in the 2000s and then 2007-8. Of course, we ran into the recession and lots of IA people were laid off. So it looked like it was going to disappear for a little bit. But I, I think happy to say that it's rebounded and it's growing again. And it's combining a lot with the UX field and just basically the whole concept of user needs analysis, which itself, by the way, goes back decades. I mean, everything in your car, for instance, goes through user needs analysis in some format. Literally with all the control knobs are and how they put on the steering wheel and how far you have to reach for the average person and all the little comfort components to your seat all come from user needs analysis. <clears throat> um, the IA Summit and the IA Institute, by the way, the summit is going on right now mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. Um, I just heard from the president of ACES today. We got some more data for because I'm doing focus groups on strategic planning for ACES. She sent me some stuff. They just had a focus group today at the IA Summit. It's a wonderful thing to go to, which, by the way, started here in Boston. The first ever was in Boston. In 90... 1999, when yeah. I was president. Yep. Yeah. I figured was, you'd know. That was a great, wonderful meeting. Yes. It's so exciting. I've been to some of them. I haven't been to all of them, but I have been to some of them. It's hard to get my to get Harvard to pay for anything in that in that area for me, given that I'm a collections librarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, then why do I need to go to an IA Summit? <laughs> Fascinating, though. If you can afford to go, particularly at the student rate, do it. Very intellectually stimulating. Now, my plug for ACES and my story on the world field of things like this. Um, so, just as a note, this is an ACES event. It's obviously for the students, but you know the, the chapters here as well, well represented, and the national level is actually pretty well represented. You get two past presidents here. That's pretty rare <laughs> in the process. Um, I started in '94. And I started because a colleague of mine, and some of you know her, Beata Anagopoulos, said, hey, Mike, you know, I'm part of this new, org, this new organization, and we're having a meeting over at BU. 
interested in the theology school, and we're planning some really interesting stuff. Would you like to come along? I'd like to be at a show. <laughs> I had no clue what ACES was. And I didn't. Really? No clue at all. <laughs> I knew what ALA was and SLA. And I've been active, sort of in both of those at that point. And then I learned about this thing called ACES and the program committee and the programs that we were doing in the local chapter. Fascinating stuff. And you get so much out of it. Just like you do in any volunteering. So like if you're a student, you really do want to volunteer for organizations, for the networking, for the learning capabilities, and for the skill sets that you pick up along the way. Now some people say I'm an okay presenter. So the thing is, <laughs> I didn't know how to present it. I was like stiff early on in my career. I don't know what to do, I'm staring at you. <laughs> you build these skill sets up from practice having lots of opportunities. I gained a tremendous amount of my opportunities early on in working in the local chapter of the legal chapter basis, which I eventually became chair of, program chair and then chair. And then I got co-opted and started doing things on the national level. Only recently have I begun stepping back and trying to do things on a variety of local levels, although I'm still doing a tremendous amount on the national level. Um, ACES today is changing. Um, it's changed a lot since I was there. Practitioners are not as common. It's a key theme we're hearing a lot, particularly as I'm running the strategic planning process and doing lots of focus groups, etc. So you can pretty much expect a big change in the near future welcoming back practitioners from all sorts of areas. I know the president right now, Sandy Hirsch from San Jose, is like hearing this all the time. As is Nadia Hadi, who's going to be the incoming president, and the whole board of directors is hearing this. There will be big changes in the next year or two. Not the least of which was the new website. Has anyone seen the new website? Woo! Yes, it went live, literally, just a ago. So, it's a much big improvement. It has some issues, but just a few. Not as many as the, the old website had. So, and uh, why the squirrel images? Um, yes. <laughs> and if you ever get to an annual meeting, oh there is a special interest group, and this is the only place you'll hear it, it's SIGCON. Now, I went to my first annual meeting in 94, and I had no clue what is this CCON everyone kept saying you should go to. It's not even on the program, per se, at that point. Like, is this a secret meeting? Is this where the real decisions are made behind the scenes? It's a comedy presentation. It's a panel session where people get up, like me, Candy, and others, who get up and talk as if what they're talking about is real. Mine was on the information behavior of squirrels. <laughs> These are some of the photos that came from my presentation about seven or eight years ago. Um, and it went into all the various behaviors of what squirrels do, based on a variety of subsets that I used from Harvard Yard. And then I had an elk group. And I'm like, the Harvard squirrels were much smarter than the <laughs> But they didn't get along very well, like this one drinking the beer. You can see that in the, the Harvard squirrels. <laughs> so this, so this, this actually took up, I found my old presentation and I started taking out all the, the images from that. So I'm just going to end now. And so this is my favorite photo that I found. And it makes me think I should be creating some more of these you know, in the near future. If you have any questions, ask. I'm generally approachable. <laughs> Except when? Yeah. <laughs> no. Between midnight and 6 a.m. Actually, right? that's not such a bad one either. It's not too bad to that process. Um, usually, when I'm highly engaged in working on a project and my mind is highly focused, I could, you could all walk by me and you know after this, if I was doing that, and I would never know you were there. That's my biggest thing. So, uh, we're all sorry. I'm back in the human race again. <laughs> You'll see that a lot. So thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yep, I didn't expect it from this presentation. Okay, very good. Yes.